Hi there, Jim Pankowitz here from Got Backing. Welcome to Lessons from the Carp Lodge, the original video series demonstrating how to catch carp on the fly. This is episode 6, Adapting to Different Conditions and Dropping the Fly. To be successful at carp fishing, you need to do four things. You need to understand carp behavior, where you are and where you fish, evaluate what you see, make decisions, and adapt. Recently, Trevor over at Fly Carpin did a survey of 200 carp fishermen. One of the results he published was the distance at which guys catch most of their carp. Most of the fish that I catch are 25 to 40 feet away. People might be surprised, I sure was, at the result he published showing the distance at which most guys catch their carp. And you'd be surprised to see how close most of them are. The carp fishing I enjoy most is when I can make medium to long range casts to tailing, uh, slow cruising, or shopping fish. Oh, I love that. Here's a tailing fish in the Columbia River and casting to fish like this is just so exciting and so engaging. Casting to tailing fish that are 25 to 40 feet away just isn't always what I get to do, though. Murky water, cloudy skies, and serious wind often conspire to keep carp from being visible to me until I am very close to them. When I am fishing in less than ideal conditions, I make decisions and I adapt. Sometimes the only way that I'm going to get hookups is to move very slowly, get close to a fish, and then literally reach out and drop the fly in front of them. In this situation, it's the waiting, the stalking, and the spotting of fish that's challenging, not dropping. That method of presenting the fly, dropping, isn't anywhere near as challenging as making a long, accurate cast. And in fact, it's not as fun either. But in certain circumstances, it's the only way I'm going to catch carp. So. I adapt and make the best of it. Sometimes the wind blows here in central Washington and Oregon. Well, actually, it's more like sometimes the wind howls here. In this next clip, the wind is howling, and it's made the water murky. Thankfully, though, the sky is clear, and so I can just barely see this tailing fish. The camera doesn't even pick him up. You'll, you'll see the drop at the four second mark. The rod will appear briefly on the right side of the screen. I drop the fly in front of this tailing fish. Wait a few seconds. He moves forward. He picks it up. I set the hook. Then you'll see him. As much as I love casting and spotting fish 20, 30, 40, 50 feet away, I can't see this fish till I'm right on top of him. Conditions are adverse, so I adapt my techniques. In this next clip, the water is somewhat murky. At least the wind isn't blowing. Again, because the water is murky, I have to get very close to fish before I can see them. This 
In this next clip, the camera does pick up this tailing fish. I'm close to him. I reach out, drop the fly, right in front of him and off to his right. You'll see him turn to his right, clearly pick up the fly. Um, my favorite carp are the ones that take my fly. I love those carp. This one picks up my fly. What a nice carp. Tailing or slow cruising fish in clear water are my favorites, like I said, but that isn't always what I get to fish for. In the introduction, I said that to be successful at fly fishing for carp, you need to do four things. Understand carp behavior, evaluate what it is you're seeing, make decisions, and adapt. A big part of understanding carp behavior is understanding which fish are the good targets. Do I present to this fish or do I ignore them? Another very important part of understanding carp behavior is knowing what the food sources are where you fish. Where you fish, the, the carp may only eat one thing. Uh, they may eat 10 or 15 things. Carp are extremely adaptable and opportunistic. They are able to choose lots of different food sources and it's important to understand what those food sources are and how their behavior can change as they choose a different food source. Carp don't have teeth like a shark um, or a muskie or a Sierra mackerel. They are they have subterminal mouths. They are with no teeth in the front. They are nevertheless very efficient predators. And like any predator, they're interested in ROI, return on investment. The investment that they make in obtaining calories has to provide them a meaningful return. So they choose what's easy. They choose what's available. They eat what they can easily get to. On my home waters, that primarily means that they're feeding off the bottom like the fish we saw in that first clip. But in the Columbia River, where I fish primarily, there are lots and lots of food sources. I've seen carp eating caddis, stoneflies, chronomids, bloodworms, clams, um, and damsels. For a period of time in the summer, the damsels hatch. And when they do, they swim up from the bottom looking for something stationary to crawl onto. It might be a log, it might be something as simple as a stick. Uh, they'll even crawl up my leg. Uh, it might be a patch of weeds, it might be a, a giant patch of weeds. About that time in the summer when the damsels are ready to hatch, a lot of weed patches start to appear in the Columbia River. Um, there are days when there can be hundreds and hundreds of these weed patches and thousands and thousands of damsels hatching and they'll hatch for two or three hours sometimes. Here's a carp oh, this carp had nice shoulders too. I would have sure liked to catch this fish. Here's a carp that just finished feeding from under one of these small weed patches. He's bigger than the weed patch. Um, he, he's just swimming out looking for somewhere else to eat and I'm reaching out trying to drop the fly in front of him and I never quite get caught up with him. This is an example of making decisions. And I didn't make a good decision. I should have let this carp find another place to eat, get settled in, and then go over and put the fly in front of him. I was too hasty. This next fish isn't tailing in the classic sense, but he is feeding very seriously on damsels just under the weeds. He's a prime target. When I'm stocking fish that are feeding on damsels like this, usually all I get is just one split second glimpse of their tail. It looks like this. For the fish in this clip, we're going to get a much better look at him chowing down at the damsel delivery station.
carp are selective, but not as selective as Spring Creek trout that I fish for. I think of them as being elective, and by that I mean they may be very focused on eating one thing at the moment, like these carp are feeding on damsels, but they will still elect to eat something that looks like food to them. Um, now, I'm not saying that carp will take just any old fly. I've tried a lot of different flies for them, and I, I've tried some of my bright, flashy salmon flies, and I can't get a carp to take one. So I'm not saying they'll take anything, but I am saying that they are elective, they eat so many different things. If I'm looking at a feeding fish, um, if I get something that looks reasonable to him, near him, I got a good chance of him taking. Now, I tie some good damsel imitations. I tie one that's very precise and realistic. I carry it. I've caught carp on it. I tie one that's more impressionistic. I've caught carp on it. Caught lots of lots of trout on them. Um, but again, carp are elective and not so selective. So, as I see these fish, even though I'm carrying damsels that day, I don't bother to change. I'm not fishing a damsel imitation. I just know I need to get it near them. Um, when I started carp fishing, I, I spent so much time um, with big crayfish patterns and trying to match this and trying to match that and realized I wasn't helping myself. And that's why I've gravitated these last many years to simple, uh, general, suggestive flies. And, and that's largely what I have uh, the best success with. In January of this year, the first comprehensive book on carp flies was published. It's called The Orvis Beginner's Guide to Carp Flies, 101 Patterns, How and When to Use Them. The author, Dan Frazier, did such a great job of researching effective, effective carp flies from across the country and explaining how to use them in different circumstances. The organization in the book, the information, the photography, and the patterns are all excellent. Check out his book. I know you'll find something useful in it. Oh, and one more thing. Um, the fly on the cover here, Black Betty. Uh, well, quite a number of carp in my videos have taken this very fly. I just caught a very quick glimpse of this next fish's tail. It doesn't show up um, on the video. I reach out, I drop the fly, he moves forward, he picks it up. I really like the fish that take the fly. Once again, in this next clip, I catch just a very brief glimpse of the fish's tail. It doesn't show up in the video. I drop the fly out in front of where I know his head is. Watch carefully. You'll see him dart out from under the weeds, pick up the fly, and I set the hook. Boy, he just turns and flies down the river. I love those hot fish. I don't always get to make long casts to tailing fish. Sometimes the weather and water conditions require that I step up and just drop the fly in front of a fish. That's the only way I'm going to catch them. And other times, the manner in which they are feeding requires me to step up and drop the fly. Understanding carp behavior and adapting my techniques helps me to be successful catching carp in a lot of different situations. Heck. If I wasn't adaptable, I would have never started carp fishing in the first place. That's the end of episode 6. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for watching.